computer. So hi, everybody, and welcome to session number three of our uh, instructional design series with Jennifer Good. Uh, in this in se session number one, we got an intro to uh, instructional design and Addy. And now in session number three, we're going back to revisit Addy and learn some pro tips and some things you may not know and review some of the things that we already know. So I'm looking forward to today's presentation. Um, Jennifer, I have asked you to talk about Anipso. Tell us what the word means. Uh, it's the company that you founded and it also has an academy. So yeah. without further ado, take it away, Jennifer. Thanks so much, Vicki, and thanks everyone for the warm welcome and for having me back again. Um, this is um, this has been a fun series, and I've really enjoyed connecting with the uh, the SIG and for instructional design and learning. And and uh, I hope that that continues to do great things. And I love being involved with it. So thanks so much for putting this on. Uh, yeah. So uh, a little bit about me. I've I've done a lot of consulting in the past. I've worked in industries. I've worked in um, for, as a consultant for the Air Force, and I worked as consultant for higher ed and a couple and in tech and a couple other industries. And I was like, you know what? I really should just make this official. And so I gave my company a name after years and years and years of consulting. And I, you know, these things you 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 search over uh, the the world for something that has a good domain. Pre uh, presence and by that mean it by that I mean it has no domain presence nobody has found it yet and uh, so I did all kinds of things but as a um, you know somebody who thinks about things deeply a lot I I was like I want a word that has meaning I want something I don't just want good consulting um, and turns out there's a lot of good consultants out there so that didn't work so well and then uh, I I came across the Greek word for elevate and it's it's the word anipso and it rhymes with calypso so if you if you want to think of the the storm and the sea the that that you think of wayfarers um facing but anipso it comes from a greek word that means to elevate and i really connected with that because what i try to do is help people can uh, elevate their own work elevate their professional skills elevate their teams and then elevate their organization through instructional design and learning i really think instructional design learning and change has the ability to elevate and help us take our work to the next level our orgs to the next level our services and our communities to the next level so it seemed to resonate really strongly with me and the domain was free uh, and uh, available so i was able to grab it and uh, I've been going ever since. And um, so I'm I'm officially consulting now under that umbrella, but I'm doing some exciting work that I was sharing with Vicki earlier uh, on the call. And that is that I'm, I'm launching an Ipso Academy. And so there will be coaching, there will be, uh, there are several courses that are about to go live and I'm just gonna keep building those and, and setting those free. So uh, you can go over and check those out. They're linked on my LinkedIn um, page if you want to just see what I'm up to. Um, and then I'll have a link at the end of the session for that. And then I'm also working on a book. So stay tuned. Uh, no rest for the weary, but I can't turn off uh, thinking about all this stuff and how it connects. And I'm so excited to share it. So I thought I better use my my uh, life energy for good things. And so if it's going on up here, I'm going to do it here and, and share it with everybody I know. So that's that's kind of what's in the works. Still doing my consulting full time and I'm loving it. So uh, this is definitely my home. Thanks so much, Vicki, for putting that LinkedIn in the chat. So today, what are we going to talk about? We did. We talked about uh, what is instructional design for folks who are uh, technical writers and coming over into the field. We talked about Addy as the process that most of us adhere to loosely or uh, very strongly in our work for how we work through the process of creating instruction for organizations all the way from conception to launch and evaluation. So um, today what I thought we would talk about is circle back to Addie one last time, if you don't mind, um, the slight redundancy. And what we would do instead of looking at the steps uh, would be looking at what value we can bring as instructional designers and how we can substantiate that value 
um, particularly through the last two steps. In our second session, we went really deep dive and did some workshops on A, D, and D analysis, design, and development. And I've got some new worksheets and new um, handouts for you. You should have received as a registrant a packet that has all my handouts for today. And Vicki has the slides that she's gonna send out to everyone as well. Uh, so you should be well prepared for today's session. And uh, even if you didn't print them out beforehand, um, jot them down, grab a piece of paper, grab a pen. Um, there's some things to brainstorm for you and your work, or you can partner up with someone else in the room and have a, have a collaborative session and learn from each other as always. Uh, I don't treat this as a lecture. I don't want this to be a lecture. It's it's much more fun. It's much more engaging. And I learn when you speak. So if you guys have questions, you have comments, you have insights from your work, I do hope you will once again be willing to share those with us as we all learn from each other in today's session. It's going to be great. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so again, this is what we're going to hit. We're going to talk about instructional design and Addy, just because I saw a few people who didn't catch our last two sessions on the registration today. So I'll loop them in, bring them up to speed in like five minutes, and then we're going to get started on some new stuff. Uh, this is me. I've been here for 20 years in the field and I love it. That's basically all you need to know. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about instructional design really quickly. I define it and you'll find across the field, we typically design instruction to create targeted learning experiences for a specific audience uh, that helps them perform better on the job, solve a problem or use a product. So uh, I spoke to a bunch of kids uh, this week at a career fair about instructional designers. I mean, how many times when you were a kid did a instructional designer pop up at a career fair? Well, I was that that one this week and, uh, you know, kind of brought them some Legos and, and went through the instructions and figure out how, why, why do we need instructions? And that's what we do. We help people use products, put things together, solve their problems and get from point A to point B a lot faster and hopefully with a lot less frustration. It's instructional in nature because we are doing teaching things. We're learning uh, with, with our audiences and helping them with that learning process. So we're using learning theories, we're using andragogy, all those things that you know about uh, learning psychology. But we're also using all the things that are fundamental to tech com, right? So wrong, strong writing, um, great visual design, and enhancing that learning experience with additional creativity and lots of design strategies. So. Uh, it's a left brain, right brain, uh, happy place, right, for us because we've got the technical and we've got the creative married into one field, and, and don't we all love it for that reason? And if you don't know what we produce, if you're unfamiliar with the field, here are some of the products that we might be a part of developing just because they are instructional in nature. They help people learn or move forward on a process or a product that they don't know much about. These are some of the tools, again, that we've used. I covered this earlier. This is from our first session, but just wanted to, to mention that there are lots of tools that you can be involved in. Don't have to know all of them, um, but certainly specializing in certain areas. If you're into media production, then all the Adobe Suite's gonna be really important to you. If you're more on the measurement analysis, then you're doing more data in Excel. So, you know, you can kind of specialize and hone in on your area of expertise, and that's kind of nice as well for a field of practice. Okay, the next session, session two, we went through Addy, and this was simply a systematized process that we could repeat, it became reliable, and it yielded consistent ID work. So we go through a phase that has five steps of analysis, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. And we kind of cycle back through that because in the analysis phase, we're studying the problem, we're trying to figure out is training really the answer? We talked a little bit about why training is only meant to solve knowledge, skills, and attitudinal problems. So we can't really affect anything else outside of that. There are lots of solutions uh, for solving technology problems or management problems, but not necessarily um, skill problems, knowledge problems, attitudinal problems. So these are the things that we work with specifically in uh, instructional design, and we're looking to make sure and validate that that is, in fact, the kind of problem we're looking at. And we also look a lot at the audience and context, just like any good tech commer will. Uh, we want to make sure that we are targeting in on them and providing them content in the way, format, design, um, timing that's best for them. In our second phase of design, that's when we take all that information that we've done in research, we kind of make out a plan. We look to see what kind of delivery strategies, we incorporate those learning 
theories that we know. Um, we start looking at content, structuring it into some sort of format and designing some of the interactions for how this will go. There's lots of revisions, lots of reviews, and uh, it's an exciting time as, as we kind of build toward a vision. And then we move into develop. Once it's all approved, we start to develop. We develop audio, we develop graphics, we develop e-learns. And for all the courses that I'm developing for Nipso Academy, this is where I am. Everything's built or designed. I'm just trying to get everything built and out the door. Um, and it's a fun process, but it can be tedious at times just because of the volume of edits and the volume of, of content that has to be produced. Um, but again, you're getting that creative, that creative um, burst of energy. So infographics, lots of slide decks, lots of um, interactives and things like that. So a lot of fun things to develop as well if you're a creative, um, a creative like me, myself. Once we implement it today, this is where we're gonna pick up um, in our workshop. When we do some implementation, that's where we're going to actually test or do some pilot testing, maybe some user testing. We start putting it into the learning management system, the LMS, make sure it's working there. We launch our comms and then we actually launch the program. You know, we're going to talk about how um, how do we launch that? How do we get it started? And what do we need to do as we plan for governance? I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that later. Um, but lots of things that we still are doing, even though it's off of our computers and in the World Wide Web, perhaps, uh, or at least the company intranet, right? Um, but sometimes it's there's still a lot of work to do and, and we don't we don't realize that or we forget that in our planning. But yes, an instructional designer's work is never done. And eventually we, we are called back upon to evaluate. Um, so we want to study things. How did, the, how did the results turn out? Did people complete it? Did they learn what they were supposed to learn? Did they have the outcomes that they, we wanted them to have? Um, and we report that out and we look at how can we improve it because in the end, you guessed it, it's a cyclical process. Uh, we go back to the drawing board and take that data back to analyze. And when we launch version two or next year's release, um, then we need to have some data from the first round to build into the feedback system that informs our improvements. And so then we start the whole process again. Uh, and I've got several projects like that that are, you know, finishing up the analyze after the, the hard turnaround at the, the end of the year loop, and we're going right back for it. So uh, this never never ends, but it does keep you busy throughout the year as you launch and relaunch over and over. The first page in your handouts, uh, if you've been with us the whole time, uh, you saw this last time. This is just a summary of what we talked about. So if Addie is new to you, uh, or if you uh, thought, hey, there's a couple of steps in there I hadn't considered under each one of those, I did re- um, re-release this slide for you in our handouts, and I thought that might be of help for you, just as a quick reference. And then, of course, today we're going to build off of it some more. So let's get started. Let's talk a little bit about how to find value. Uh, again, we're going to focus on implementation. And so implementation is, again, where we have already designed everything. We've got the software, we've got the training, we've got the e-learns built, we've got the the videos recorded, everything's ready to go. The courses are built, the training is built, the instructional manuals are written, the booklets are published, we're ready to roll. And so we're gonna focus a little bit more on implementation here. Um, during implementation, this is where I really recommend that you do some user and accessibility testing. So for user testing, if you can get a sample of your actual users, um, or somebody who's representative of your audience and have them test it. This is not somebody who worked with you on the team to develop the training. <laughs> okay, we're really wanting a fresh set of eyes, ideally in the same scenario or very similar scenario to somebody who's working, uh, going to work with these uh, trainings, guides in real life. Um, we wanna watch them. We wanna do some monitoring. We wanna ask them some deep probing questions about, hey, was this laid out right? Did you encounter any problems? Were you frustrated or unclear about anything? Um, if you use the think out loud product protocol um, during that, if it's something where your user testing in person, the think out loud protocol works really well um, and helps you uncover some of those thoughts along the way and not having to pry them out of the users at the very end. But what that says, that, that strategy says is that we as observers come alongside and say, here's a, website with some training videos and structure built in with some diagrams. 
I want to give you three tasks maybe that you should have already known how to do or be able to do when you have this training in front of you. I know you've never seen the training and you never used it before. I'm gonna give you these tasks that a typical user should be able to do with the training guide and our product in hand. And I'm just gonna watch you. But if you think out loud and tell me what you're thinking, what you're doing, what steps you're following, why you're making the decisions you are, then I can take some notes on that. And what those kind of stream of consciousness thoughts uh, come about, and bring about are some real clarity and like, well, I'm going to go to file and then open because I'm looking for a schematic. Oh, there is no menu here in this platform. So I'm going to go over here to resources and you kind of start seeing, oh, well, they were looking here first and then they looked there second. So maybe we need to reorder some of the way that we present things. So if you've not done user testing, that's an area that you could follow up on. There's lots of great tutorials and videos out there, especially on YouTube um, and, and some guides on GitHub as well, on Reddit as well, some threads there. Um, but if that's new to you and you're interested and that intrigues you, it may be something that you could use. Definitely user testing is valuable to build that time in to get that feedback, especially if you have a really big expensive system that you put a lot of resourcing into. It helps you to keep those uh, little trips from happening on your first launch. You can also do some accessibility testing, which is similar in that we're trying to break the system from a, from a usability standard. So if we um, look through accessibility standards for um, Web3 and um, some of the other guidelines with color contrast, closed captioning, alt text, um, opening up on different browsers. So establishing what those things look like and what the parameters are for your organization and then making sure that folks with a variety of accessibility needs can all access the content and get it as easily as the next person. It's really, really important. And it does a lot. Um, can I just tell you from a user standpoint, that kind of testing, um, having something that works on the first time that you don't have to struggle with the technology in order to learn the knowledge. Um, people will not only love you for it, um, but they will love your product for it. Okay, so when we eliminate those boundaries and those, those hurdles that make using our product materials difficult, then we make our product all the more easier to use as well. So I highly, highly, highly recommend accessibility testing. Then of course we can take it to a pilot program. If you're doing stand-up training, this is where you gather your first class and you launch it. You see how it works, see what they didn't like, what they did like and what you should keep and what you should throw out the door. Um, hopefully you've already uh, eliminated a bunch of that extraneous thing, the extraneous content that doesn't belong, but, uh, and you've got a pretty solid program and you're just tweaking, but you never know. So pilot program is a good way to go for that. Uh, then you launch the program. Uh, when you launch, uh, there is a bit of celebration on the team usually. <laughs> I know when my team gets out the door, we're like, yes, we finally did it. And everybody kind of sighs this collective sigh of relief. Do you guys have that where you work? Um, I know we do. And so, um, but but then we're right on to it. We're, we're holding those uh, every day or every other day or once a week monitoring meetings, we're looking at rates and looking at user interactions and completion rates and time to complete and checking all the forms and the comments fields to make sure nobody's having any problems. If their feedback is having, if they're getting feedback that there's things are hanging up, then we've got a tech team that we can deploy to fix it immediately. So these are good things to do um, to remember that just because it's out of your department and it's launched into the real world that um, there are still things that can go wrong. And even if it's a stand up training, um, just being there on site, making sure, oh, we were out, we were short five copies or whatever, making sure that we get get the, the launch going even, even um, after it's officially um, a live training program. So um, I do always recommend um, meeting periodically with your stakeholders to review things, um, that, like I say on the bottom, that's just been very helpful and fruitful. Uh, are there other processes that you guys have done as far as implementation? I've got a, a graphic I want to show you next. But did you want to pause and see what you guys have, have encountered? So, Jennifer, I wanted to talk a little bit about some user testing that we at the IDL did. 
uh, for our website. And uh, I merely might want to chime in a little bit. It was so much fun. We laughed and laughed. We knew we were revamping the website because it needs it. It's, uh, the design is probably eight years old. Um, and so we had some intrepid volunteers and we had a couple of things. One of the things that we wanted to ask them to do is find how to sign up for this workshop, right? From the website and we just people, I love watching people stumble around and telling us their thought process as they stumble around. And we were able to fix a few things immediately, but we just got we got a lot of data, but we had so much fun. User testing is a hoot, especially if everybody keeps the right attitude. You know, we're, we know uh, that we know how to use this website, but you don't know how to use it. So show us where we can make an improvement. And it was like probably 40 minutes because we had three different volunteers and it was 40 minutes of just laughing and laughing and thanking people so much for being such good sports and letting us watch them. You know, it, I just think user testing is a hoot. So it is fun. I love that story. Thank you for sharing, Vicki. I, I can't agree more. Um, it is a hoot. It is fun, especially when you're doing it with a really great team. Um, and as long as you tell your participants, we're not evaluating you, we're evaluating our website. And I love how you put it. Vicki, uh, we know we can use our website, but we don't know if anybody else can. <laughs> and uh, so that's really what you're trying to do. I'll also say that um, when I do user testing, if it's in person, I always bring chocolate. So that really bumps the enjoyment level up from everyone. <laughs> uh, good. Any others? Yeah, if you can if you can swing user testing, oh, it's just a, a glorious thing, and you get such good feedback. Pilot program is one thing, but user testing, oh, I love it. Okay, so I've got this graphic here for you, and this graphic is uh, our road to the training launch. And what I like about um, thinking of it as a road uh, is that really any of these flags can happen in any number of order, at the end, you have to launch your training. So we're not gonna move that one around, but it, it, your organization, there may be different timelines for how you encounter these. But what I want you to think about with this graphic is that we set the stage early on for launching. We don't just come out of all uh, the development phase and like, okay, we're ready, let's do this. Um, sometimes we do that, but we need to back up and think, have we done this? Have we done that? Have we paved the road for uh, all these other things to be ready to move? So uh, one of the things that you want to make sure that you've done first off is an audience enrollment. Now, hopefully this came up during, uh, during your analysis and you identified your audience. Now we're looking at enrolling them. So if it's an e-learn or a learning management system that's controlling this, then we need to enroll them in the course. How are they going to get from unenrolled? to enrolled? Are you going to mandatorily put them in your learning program? Can HR do that for you? Or do you have to have them self-enroll? Or is it an in-person class where you have to have them show up? Do you need to transport them there? Do you need to reserve hotel rooms? Do we have to have everybody on site? Um, there's so many things that's not just audience identification, um, but audience enrollment. How are we going to get there? Who has to be there? Who is optional? And then when is it due? So when are we going to have this group of people do uh, our training? You know, if it's a one-day training on site, then everybody's done at the same time. But if it's an e-learn and you say it's, it's on assignment, you've got four weeks to complete, it's due at the end of March. Uh, and you have a two-week grace period in case you happen to be on vacation during that time or a leave of absence or something like that. So thinking about those parameters, about how you're going to control for that by audience group. Um, a lot of organizations also classify their employees, and that may be true for you all uh, where you work. And so you might have individual contributors, managers, directors, VP level, and executive, or some other um, nomenclature for how you hierarchically classify each of your groups. 
And I will just tell you that if you are designing training that's in the upper echelons of the organization, there's a whole lot of sensitivity that around who needs to take it and why. And so you may even get some pushback from legal and saying, is this really necessary for this team to look at? And so, you know, you'll have to be able to defend and justify who needs to take that and why that audience assignment is necessary. If it's for legal matters, if it's to fulfill an agreement, uh, or if it's a company policy or annual mandatory training, something like that. So um, just think about that and be aware that if you are prescribing that it, it go all the way up to the top of the organization, there could be some resistance just because those folks are busy um, and we only want to send them training and to do items when they absolutely have to. So think through that carefully as you're working through audience enrollment. Um, once you figure out who needs to be enrolled, then we want to talk a little bit more about how we're going to reach them with a, a solid communication plan. Uh, a lot of folks will say, well, I'm just going to email them. I'm like, okay, well, that's great. Do, does everybody check their emails? Do they open all the emails or are there different emails that they pay attention to the sender versus other senders that they don't pay attention to emails from? Like, what? What's the real caveat here? How's, how are we going to get this uh, notification pushed out? And so a lot of times we see a lot more um, creativity when it comes to communication plans. We want to show them in multiple ways or tell them in multiple ways that they're they're coming up on this training. Why have they been enrolled? Why? What's the value that they're going to get out of this? Why are we releasing this training? Um, and then what, what will they need to find out or what will they need to do next in order to participate? So that communication plan may happen in an email, but I would suspect that it's going to be more multi- dimensional as far as communications go and that the format might be some oral communication, some electronic. Um, there may be some other flags that your organizations have as far as like assignment through an LMS that generates, you know, some sort of ticket or notification for you that you have training that's required. Um, so we know that we want to craft those messages to be short and direct and to the point. Um, nobody wants to read a five page soliloquy on why they need to take a training. Like, yeah, by the time I read that, I could have just taken the training. Just tell me what I need to know. So I always recommend having just a, a very short blurb, um, definitely a couple hundred words or less that says, this is the training. This is what's required of you. Here's why you're taking it. And here's what you're going to get out of it. Um, just those kind of high level comms that will help them to understand what's being done and what, how they need to act. Um, moving into the next phase, that's accessibility review. We talked a little bit about that just a minute ago, but looking and testing to see that all the training resources are accessible to all the users. Like looking at the slide, you can see that there's really dark text on a light background. Did you know that there are prescriptive uh, variations for how the color differentiation between text and the background um, that, that qualifies for accessibility levels or disqualifies content for accessibility levels. And so you can read up on that. Um, the WCA3, um, W3CAC work has, has done some fabulous documentation of that. So you can search on that accessibility standards for web uh, 3.0. Um, you can look through all of those and come up with some standards. Your organization may even have some of those standards for their website, for their products and services, um, and making sure that your training adheres to that. It's going to be, again, um, breaking down barriers for use for your products and services as a company. And then for internal training, it's going to elevate and lift and connect your, your employees who need that extra support and make them feel included and heard and seen. So all around a great thing to go through accessibility review. And we can talk more about that in a few minutes. We talked about user testing. Vicki gave a great example. And so uh, that, is, that is a good thing to do. Does the training actually work? We want to test it on lots of machines. Um, I went through some usability testing recently with a, a vendor and it was like, this is not even opening. Um, so we had to send it back. And so you know, things like, does it work? Does it run on all the platforms? Can, can our users complete the whole program? Can they take the test at the end and pass? Um, publication and hosting, most of the time we know where it's going. It's going to live in an LMS. It's going to be given at a conference or it's going to be giving at uh, an on-site meeting. Um, but where will all the files live? 
that, you know, we've developed all these handouts. We've developed slideshows, we've developed videos, maybe some test bank questions. Like where are we gonna put all the developmental materials so that when we do have to repeat this process and relaunch, that we can find the original source files and not have to recreate the wheel, right? So hosting and launching is one thing, but also publishing and, and saving uh, the repository of files, make sure they're organized. If hopefully you've got some sort of rhyme or reason to the structure of the files and how they're structured within the filing system within your organization. If not, it's a great time to, to establish something that works for your team. Um, moving, to, moving on to the next phase, governance and enforcement, we need in some cases to monitor, govern, and enforce training participation. Um, if you can think of um, uh, sexual harassment training is something that a lot of organizations are required by state law, and it's an annual training that everybody has to take, and you have to document that they stayed in the training and took it for a certain amount of time. Um, based on different state laws. Where you live, it may be different, um, but we've all had to take some sort of training such as that, that is required by the state and we have to sit through it, it has to be timed. And so in those cases, we have to have timers, we have to have monitors, we have to have, in some cases, um, a sign on or a card swipe or a badge swipe to indicate that that person has actually been in there, um, a, an authentication through login. Uh, the other thing is we have to, to identify the folks who have skipped out on the training or are past due on the training. And in some cases, we need to enforce that they take the training through shutting down certain systems or access to systems. Of course, that can be uh, very hard on employees. So that's kind of like the last straw to use, but it can be a very good motivator. And you wouldn't want to use that on everything, right? If you were doing soft skills training on being a, a great public speaker, you wouldn't use a lockout. Uh, or a system lockout to to uh, threaten them to take that 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 would be used for something that was more legally or um, regulation um, related. So then finally, after all these things, we should be ready for training launch. It's go time. And so I want to know, based on this road map, um, do you all use these? Are these things that you see in your processes where you work in your training? And if, if not, uh, what other processes are there? And would you add anything else or move anything around or tell us more details about how you do any of these processes as you uh, work towards launching your training? Jennifer? Yeah. This is Bobby. Um... So I'm a bit of a wedding crasher here. Um, I don't develop training. <laughs> I manage a team that develops user docs, but I'm really intrigued with the user testing, the clinical testing that we have to do on our medical devices and the impact that that has on our user docs. And so we love it when we can participate as observers in that whole process. Um, and because our user docs are considered a mitigation against risk. Um, you know, there's a clear connection between the testing, the results of the testing, the protocols, and how they're developed and the impact on our, our user documentation. Um, now, what happens in our business is that we develop the user docs, and then our training group mines our content to create the training that they use to train customers um, and actually to train our customer care team to answer questions from customers. So, you know, it's, it's you know, not a process where, I, I don't know what they do on this road, on this path. I do know that they consume user documentation that has gone through some testing already to ensure that it's complete, it's accurate, that it does what it needs to do for our customers. And then, you know, they develop their training from there. Oh, that's fantastic, Bobby. I appreciate that. So you got an intersection on our map here. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I love it. No, that, that's, that, is, that is totally normal. Um, I get a lot of intake documents that have already been published. They'll say, this is already out there on the, 
internal wiki or this is already out there on this and that such resource use this document we've already published and create training from it um so i would say that's not as uncommon in the training industry but i love that you've got several checks and balances and i i'm going to echo what you said that it's a way to mitigate risk um, and so you're checking on the documentation team doing user reviews and accuracy checks along the way so that when it gets to the training team, they can also do their user reviews and testing possibly, um, but it's already gone through uh, some foundational checks for accuracy and you are hopefully mitigating that risk um, of, of, of obviously confusing your user, um, but um, more broadly just including information that wouldn't be accurate or, or um, correct within other areas of the business. So uh, kudos to your teams for having all those checks and balances along the way. Jennifer, I wanted to ask, um, th because this process is very similar to how we work in my department. Um, we don't do classroom or video training, but we do instructions on the web. And we do pretty much all of these steps not necessarily in this order, um, but we'll do them in in some form or fashion for launching or changing or updating or creating something new, except the accessibility review. And so I was going to, we don't have a whole lot of resources that we can get to, but I've noticed that like in the last version of um Microsoft PowerPoint and Word, they do have an accessibility review option in there. And I wondered if anybody that knew what they were talking about. To me, it looks good because it does a lot of contrast and it'll do, you know, is this screen reader friendly, that kind of thing. But I just wondered if anybody who knew what they were talking about with as far as accessibility had any experience with those because they basically they're free. We don't have to ask for additional tools. Has anybody used those? I've used PowerPoint um, accessibility for doing slide decks. Uh, for folks who are using screen readers, um, okay, let me let me back up. You know when you are on a web and let's say you don't have a mouse, so you're just tabbing through the fields to enter a form or something? So when a screen reader encounters PowerPoint, it has to do the same sort of thing in order to read the elements. So that's kind of interesting. So the order in which we lay elements in PowerPoint matters for Ooh. accessibility. Wow. Um, and so you know, maybe that's something I need to, to put into a worksheet or a handout somewhere. Um, but what's interesting is that there's a strategy for how you order the information. So if you have a slide deck that has chapters in it, um, you may decide not to have it read that. And so in PowerPoint, you can say omit, you can reorder, click and drag and manipulate the order in which those elements are read off, whether that be the header, chapter header, maybe the title, the body text, the graphic with the alt text, and even the flag footer that has maybe copyright and page number in it. If you think of just those basic elements that we might would see on a typical PowerPoint screen, it if you go into the accessibility review panel, you can click and drag and put those in the correct order because I think it it orders them in the order in which they were created on the in the whole presentation. Um, and so sometimes it's out of order. This is like the last thing you do before you publish the. The PowerPoint. But the other thing I found interesting when I was do researching best practices for this was that um, when folks use a screen reader, they don't necessarily like to hear uh, so, you know, copyright 2023 and ipso page seven at the, at the end of every slide. It gets redundant, it becomes noise clamorous. And so they recommended dropping some of that sort of thing out and only leaving in. Um, uh, the, the pertinent content, uh, maybe not the chapter headings at all, because they know when they're going to the next slide already, so you don't have to tell them what slide you're on. So that type of thing uh, really um, was, in, was very interesting to learn, and the latest version of PowerPoint has it as well. There's also some really good tutorials out there on the web. You can just search for best practices for developing and writing alt text and alt tags, um, because 
you can have some really descriptive paragraphs in their flowery language, and it describes everything down to a T. The light is being cast upon uh, a desk through a bright sunny window, and you're like, oh, well, that sounds lovely. <laughs> that is exactly what I'm looking at. But depending on the context of your structure and your training and your document, that might not be pertinent after all. So how do we mitigate the level of, okay, they need to know what the picture says or shows, but maybe not the color of the, the shirt that she's wearing. So, um, but yeah, I've done PowerPoint and I've done a lot with that. I've done less in Word. I haven't really played around with that as much. Thanks. Um, but there are a lot of standards for, um, that's why choosing colors is so important. There's a lot of standards for contrast and text colors and background colors and things. So, um, and the differentiation in, in those, it's down to, a, they've got it down to a numerical value. So um, definitely worth checking out and, um, and definitely helpful when you're creating any type of documentation, whether it's um, user documentation, product documentation, training documentation e-learns, on-screen, printed, whatever. Okay, so I'm gonna show you what I would take my teams through um, when we were planning a launch. Now, this is taking our roadmap and putting it into probably something like a, a mural board or um, mural, something where you can all collaborate. And if we were in the same room, we'd put sticky notes on the wall because that's how I roll. Um, I'd give everybody a deck of sticky notes and we'd say, okay, over here on this board is going to be audience enrollment and thoughts about how we communicate here and thoughts about the channels that we use here. And so then I would have everybody think about each of these phases as we brainstorm how we roll this out. And as somebody pointed out, I think Vicki was saying, we use almost all of these, but maybe not in this order. A lot of them happen concurrently. You might start the governance and enforcement process way back with audience enrollment or just after it, and it becomes like a four-lane highway, you know, because they're rolling along together, right? Um, but we've got so much that has to go into this. So you're kind of working on all of this in some ways simultaneously so that you can get it out the door, um, but also so that everything aligns and you're ready to launch at, this, at, the, at, the, at the time, because it doesn't happen linearly. Um, it really more happens collaboratively as you work with different teams to, to do this. And that all depends upon, of course, how big your organization is. Um, but audience enrollment, communication plan and challenge, uh, channels. The communication plan is what, who needs to know, how do we get it to the channels, or how do we get them that information? What platforms, uh, what tools are we going to use? Are they, their managers going to tell them they're now enrolled? Are they going to get an email? Are they going to get a prompt from the learning management system? How are they going to find out? Um, we've talked a lot about um, accessibility review. I think we've mentioned most of these um, transcripts and closed captioning. If you have content that's video based um, or audio based only and also using diverse graphics. So um, make sure that you've got some graphics that have different people involved. Um, that's always important as well. Um, I'm going to look also user testing. We've, we've talked a lot about different strategies for that. Thankfully, um, you guys have had some experience as well. Um, but there's just some really, really neat insights that you can do and obtain just from user testing. That's not that's not going to be typical. Um, we talked about the, the final files. Where are they going to live? Where is the LMS? Um, how does the LMS work and how do we get the files to them? If it's an e-learn, there's like a SCORM package, S-C-O-R-M, SCORM package, which that allows us to track, um, the, track the completion rate of the learners as they go through the training. And so it's, it's kind of like a, a monitoring system. We, we call it SCORM wrapping things. So you can SCORM wrap a video, you can SCORM wrap a whole e-learn and it'll say we can set the SCORM wrapper to assess whether or not they made an 80% on, on their final test and took all of the materials to get there in order to pass. And so the SCORM will be the communicator between our e-learn and the learning management system that it sits in and the SCORM wrapper will talk back and forth to that and um, then it will either, either register as a completion or say no you haven't passed please go back and retake. So um, you'll hear a lot about SCORM wrappers and, and SCORM materials if you do a lot of e-learns. 
Um, and good news, uh, uh, other than the settings that you have to, to do in your eLearn development tool, there's not a lot of programming. Uh, you just have to tell it uh, what your LMS is and it usually publishes uh, to the right version based on whatever your LMS is and the settings that your tech team gives you. Um, but there's really not a whole lot of, of technical work. It, it kind of auto programs it once you tell it you want a squirm wrapped product. Governance and enforcement. I was going to pause on this because this is a very interesting thing. Of all the different organizations I've worked with over my career, I've seen this done in so many ways. Some organizations like McDonald's have a whole corporate university. Have you ever, ever heard of Hamburger University? That's no joke, guys. Like they are one of the epitomes of how to do training correctly. They ensure that their billions of customers every year can walk into any McDonald's and order the same product at any McDonald's store and get practically the same exact experience from um, the menu, the fonts, the customer service back and forth and exchange between the, the people that work there down to the hamburger that, that they taste and put in their mouth afterwards. So um, that university is well renowned in the training and development field because they have just really systematized and proceduralized everything about how they train. Um, <laughs> uh, how they train, I'm laughing because I'm looking at Vicki's note in this chat that SCORM, um, SCORM is not uh, translating well in closed captioning. Um, sorry about that, Vicki. Uh, but at any rate, the, the governance enforcement can have a whole university. But then you also have systems and other organizations that have maybe very flat training organizations. And what I mean by that is they may have a training organization with different arms of their business, and it's not very centralized as it would be in a university that, that oversees all the curricula. And so um, there's pros and cons to both of those. Um, and so the, the thing that I would warn is that if you have a very flat um, structure, that if there's not enough coordination, that there can be uh, or it can seem that there's not a lot of planning or strategy about when courses are released across the organization. In reality, that might actually be happening. Um, and so what happens from a learner perspective internally is I might be working and so-and-so hits me from this direction with a training that's due next week. And as soon as I get it done, I get another one that's due the next week. And the next week I has another one that rolls out two weeks later and so forth. So on. And I'm like, if I had just had the time to set aside two or three hours at the first of the month, it would have been a lot easier for me. Instead, I have to stop what I'm doing, pull around, figure out what I got to do, get into the system, train, and then get back to work. And so from a user experience, having some sort of coordination or governance around how you deliver training, um, can be challenging, but it can also be very beneficial to your learners. So there's lots of layers within training, governance, training, enforcement, training, monitoring. Um, but there's a lot of discussion that are uh, within that area that's very contextual to the organization that you're in. OK, so I, I'm not going to prescribe anything because every organization is different for different reasons. Um, but I just would caution you that if you have if you don't have a really formal structure that says this is the intake, we're going to schedule it, it's going to go out this curriculum and that that really strong vertical structure for training and development that you think a little bit more broadly about how you release things and how that impacts your learners along the way. Uh, I'll pause on this slide and see if you guys have any thoughts here. Anybody have any thoughts about our workshop? This is something that's in your packet that you can take with you and, and use to develop uh, your own plans with your own teams. So I was going to add as part of uh, governance where I am, it, uh, we do an annual review of everything. And uh, I'm on that team and it has been really useful for um, cleaning out um, extraneous things. Uh, we have sometimes, uh, because it's a large organization, if somebody can't find something, then they'll create a new one. And so we have a, a number of duplicates. 
And so that gives us feedback, not only on our how-to instructions, but also on our uh, content architecture. If people can't find what they're looking for and create a brand new one, it usually means that we need to start uh, working on the findability, searchability, that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Um, yeah, then we're getting into all our content architecture um, teammates and, and, and uh, colleagues, right? Because you think, oh, well, what could we do? That's a huge area of op um, opportunity for those folks to make a professional impact and a huge impact uh, is to help with the structure of uh, and findability, searchability, and and um, I'm going to say life term of each training, right? When do yep. we when do we sunset it? When do we revise it? When do we get it out? When do we just make a new one? Or when do we keep using what we have? Right. And the other ability, um, discoverability, right? Uh, you may not know what you're looking for. Uh, it has to do with our vocabulary. Are we using the keywords that our audience would use? And if not, that's probably why they can't find what they're looking for. It's a lot of that going back, that house cleaning, um, keeping everything tidy and uh, trackable. It's, it's good stuff, even if you don't like doing it. So, yeah, it is tedious, but it's so impactful. If we really want people to be streamlined in their work, then we have to make training streamlined as well to, to kind of funnel in when they are, when they need that support and then immediately exit afterwards. So it is necessary housekeeping. Really good, really good stuff. I just wanted to add that uh, I, I worked for an insurance company and we had a, a big training project going. Uh, and when it came to the governance and enforcement, even though the manager supposedly of, of, of the, the group said that he would uh, provide buy-in and make the people take the, <laughs> the training at the end he balked and so uh, so everybody was really disappointed because there was no accountability uh, at the end and all of this work was done and if you don't have the people training that need to take the training then it's a very big disappointment so um, mm -hmm. I think Probably companies are a little more secure in doing that now. This was a few years ago. When I'm saying secure, I mean uh, the stakeholder has to really, you know, have their <laughs> hand put to the fire. And uh, I, I think that that's, you know, maybe is emerging as something more important these days. That is so valuable and such a great point. Um, I mentioned that review phase earlier on. We make a, a, a point of having sign-offs on all the stages of reviews, and we have a lead stakeholder. But when it comes to governance and enforceability, there's actually a project sponsor who has to sign off at that level. So it's important that um, to get that so that we don't have that risk. because That's a very, very expensive endeavor if you don't use it. Right, and that's why it's so good to have a, a, a very strong plan. The, the one that you've laid out here is excellent. And uh, and then, you know, the, the constant person who does that checks in and says, okay, well, you need to do this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you really have to have a project manager on all of this just to make it happen. I mean, forget the instructional designer. You have to have a project manager who's going to all the stakeholders, getting signed up, signed off and getting all this through because there's a lot of legwork in this um, to do it well, especially in some of these larger organizations. That, those are great, great points, Marilee. Thank you so much for sharing. Bobby, did you have something? Yeah, I, in fact, um, my antenna went up when you started talking content architecture and uh, Vicki mentioned findability, discoverability, because in our space where we're structuring our content, we're in a content management system. We're all about, you know, identifying our terminology using taxonomies and metadata and all of these things that are supposed to 
enable the user to find content more quickly, to personalize their experience with content. I'm just wondering to what extent are all of those um, concepts um, part of this model, of the training model? Um, do you talk about taxonomy? Do you talk about metadata? I mean, is that play into this whole training development scheme? Um, it depends on the organization and how mature their training department or their training processes are, I'll say. That's might been my experience. Um, but yes, if, if you've got a strong organization, then a lot of that is built into the learning management systems and you, you select keywords and you gather meta metadata. Hopefully there's a curricular path for, hey, I'm an intern and these are the things that I do on my intern journey because it's prescriptive. So we've got that metadata that, you know, it's by, by, by role and time at the organization. Um, but other triggers as well. I've, I'm in a management role. I'm overseeing employees. So there's metadata having to do with that. So, oh, we need not only um, HR and management training that's required by law, but we might also need um, some soft skills about how to resolve conflicts and things like that. So um, there's lots of triggers. And if you've, if you've got a huge repertoire of training, usually there's something that's that is some sort of system that's helping to sort all that out. I've been in places where there aren't as well. So uh, it's kind of hit or miss, but that's that's the level of what we need to talk about um, as we're publishing so that when you're working with the teams that, um, that put it into to space, if it's not your team, then if, if it's putting it into its place on the LMS, that it is identified properly. We've already got the terms from the, hopefully the analysis phase. We know where this is going to live and we confirm those and then we get sign off on them and um, we know that who's going to be assigned to them. Yeah, I guess I want to step back even further and think in terms of the whole business, reusing as much content as possible. Um, so when you're thinking of content architecture, it's not just what my tech comm team produces, but how does that overlap what training produces, what marketing delivers to the customer, um, where can we create content so that it is all kind of single sourced and then distributed or at least made accessible by all of these different parts of the business so that what the customer receives in the end is the same phrasing, the same messaging, the same consistent content um, and of course, there will be variations depending on what your your purpose is for the communication. But um, you know, this is one of the drivers behind content management. It's you know trying to create it once and reuse it wherever you can. And I just wonder, you know, kind of where is where are we on that trajectory with with training? Is there a lot of talk about that reusing? content or is it you know not quite there I love that you're asking this because um I was in a forum about a year ago and I asked is anybody doing this because I've got this training and I need to single source it and can it work with articulate rise or articulate storyline and it was crickets all these instructional designers I saw them they were looking at my message <laughs> But they didn't answer it. So um, I did look into it and I was knees deep in a Reddit thread that I could maybe program something that would make my, that would kind of come into the back end of my software. And I thought, I'm not really sure that I can build this myself. It doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be as widespread as I would have hoped. I think we are in the business of looking for approved resources. Um, and so where is, where is it already published? Where is it already live in the organization or outside the organization? And can we take that material as our source material? So I would say from a manual standpoint, yes. From a manual process, yes. Have we got it to where it's automated through some of our most popular tools? I would say, unfortunately not. Um, and that's definitely an opportunity and certainly um, certainly would be helpful. The other thing I would say is depending on the voice of the training, 
a lot of the technical content gets softened quite a bit, bit during training. And so they do use different languages. And I've seen a lot of different um, ways that we use hooks and storylines within training that would not necessarily fit the bill for technical um, content all the time as well. So it's it's marrying whatever the voice is and the structure is of the of the training need with the source material of that. And of course, you can massage it and make it make it work. But um, I would definitely say that everybody looks at that. We look for source material. We look for the authority of published documents. But I don't think anything is near automated like we think of in tech com world with single sourcing and data, unfortunately. Right. Yeah, and it kind of begs the question: Should it be? You know, I think there's a lot of talk about this as kind of the ideal, um, but I, I'm not so sure because of the very things you mentioned that, you know, it, it cannot be the same technical voice. It cannot be, you know, if your purpose is to sell, well then, eh, you know, some of that is valuable, but you've got another agenda. So your tone and your purpose is different. And I think the content is going to be different. Yes, a hundred percent. And the the I can think back on the past several projects I've worked on, and none of the technical jargon is what what is desired by the stakeholders that we use. We have links to that technical um, as resources for additional learning, but the it doesn't it doesn't hold for the training that I'm doing. So it's really shifting, you know, based on what the audience is doing and who they are. So. Um, no, I, I, I love, I love that you're thinking that too, because that was, I, I literally had a post and I watched all those people look at my, my, uh, comment and are like, we have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> no, so I, I love that your mind went there as well. Okay. Well, let's keep moving forward here. So we have now jumped over into evaluation and this is, um, the final phase of Addy. Oh, let me ask, let me say one more, more thing. If, if we look back on this, um, today what we're kind of looking at is value. And so as you look through the, both this road of the overall process and look at these, what, six areas of brainstorming that you can use with your teams, um, be thinking about implementation value. And values are are things that your organization rewards, or organization talks about, organization thinks about, organization brags about, and where can we pick up value in what we're doing here that will be recognized at the organization level, that will be um, championed in the organization level, uh, that will be uh, in line with organizational values for what they do. They do. So if your organization um, is really big on everybody being certified, then we can work that into the communication plan. And we can say, this is one of the steps this training gives you credits towards your um, certification units. And um, this will enable our teams to advance more quickly to certification. Um, if your, your organization is really into um, reaching um, you know, diversity, equity, and in inclusion and reaching all audiences, then some of the things that we do in accessibility review and user testing and making sure that those get bubbled up to your organization leaders, those things. So where is the value? Uh, where are the values, the corporate values, but then where, do, where can you share the value that you're bringing through these processes? And so I kind of want to challenge you, once you've got all this information, um, go back one more time through it and look at the value that you're trying to bring and where can you kind of align with what your organization's interests are. All right, let's move into evaluation because I see we just got a little bit of time left. Um, user feedback. Users will often be given the opportunity to comment or, or, or provide feedback immediately after training. And um, one of the things that I think is really wise is to go ahead and read all of that as soon as possible. And if you've got an e-learn that's coming in to do some continual monitoring of that, it's really interesting. But if um, if there are any red flags that even, you know, um, for not just for your training, but just on a personal level, if somebody, uh, somebody, sometimes if you have a remote workforce or if you have folks in a really large organization, sometimes they'll reach out in the most, um, 
you know, odd places, maybe you might think, or the, the things, places where you wouldn't necessarily um, expect it, but to, to monitor that, see if we see any red flags or things that need to be addressed that may or may not be related to training. Um, so I always say monitor that closely. That's real people talking to you and trying to share their thoughts and share their concerns. So um, tracking completions and activity logs, if you've got like a dashboard that can be automatically generated through your LMS, um, that's important. Monitor the user interactions and feedback. So sometimes um, I've had training where it's like nobody's watching past the 22nd point on this video. They're just closing the video. But if you look and, and do a little bit more investigation, you find out that the video is freezing or snagging. So it was a technical issue. But if we got that user interaction feedback and say they're stopping here, then we can go in and see why. And then trouble to shoot those problems. And then uh, obviously we're continually looking for improvement um, for future work. I always love to have an end of meeting, um, uh, lessons learned, celebration on training because it's like the project is over. What did we learn? What can we do differently next time? And it's a great time for us to kind of shift our perspective from what we've been through together and then using that knowledge and experience that we've learned towards focusing on our next project together, both for this particular training, but also for other training. So a lessons learned meeting might seem a little frivolous, but meet for lunch, um, do coffee in the morning or something, You know, just have a, a brainstorming time where people talk about different feedback areas. You can give it some structure and then kind of guide people through that conversation. And in the end, it can be really helpful uh, for, for lots of different reasons as you improve your training and then as you work on other. Uh, this is also a handout that's in your packet and we went through it briefly last time, but Kirkpatrick um, is a really popular um, evaluation model that you'll see trainers use a lot. Most training gets monitored or evaluated the reaction and learning level. Reaction would be, did you like the speaker? Were they entertaining? How was the temperature in the room? Um, could you get through the training and the time allotted? You know, kind of reaction. Did you enjoy yourself? Was it a good experience? But it doesn't really tell us, did we learn anything? Did we change our behaviors because we went to this training? Or did the organization see any real results? So if you move to the second phase of learning evaluation, then that's where we're like, oh, well, we're going to give you a little test. And 95% um, people of the people passed it on their first try. Great. So we're seeing some people who actually took the training and learned or at least could regurgitate what they what they learned in the session. Um, but what we're really trying to do, big picture guys, like back up three, four, five levels. And what we're really trying to do is bring about change in an organization. What we're really trying to do is bring about change in our consumers where they don't know how to use our products and now they do. Now that's really hard to monitor for folks who are outside of our organization. Because um, you can't follow your product to the market and say, you know, most, most of us can't and say, how, are they able to use our instructions? Did it work? Do they know how to use our products as a result? You know, we can't really trace them. Uh, all we can do is base it uh, on knowledge and feedback that we're getting, you know, calls to the help desk. Um, uh, are they calling for help because they still can't get it with the help of the instructions? Um, uh, are they able to use it or are we having a lot of returns? So there's some indicators we can use, but it's hard when we're look, working with products and, and uh, supporting materials for that. Internally, it's a little bit easier because we can monitor employee behavior. So if you're trying to see a change internally, that can be helpful. Results. This is very even more challenging. So the reason we see even less folks in the training industry monitoring results is because results are the hardest to track. It's basically trying to turn costs and dollars and resources that we spend on developing training and turning it into business outcomes, return on investment, um, the bottom dollar, uh, and the resulting um, mitigation of risk, right? Some of those things that, that help an organization be profitable or, um, or even successful in the market. So these are harder to identify. It takes a lot more uh, resilience, but I've worked with organizations at different levels to do all four of these. And that's, um, that's some exciting work, but it can be some challenging work as well. So while you're trying to do that, uh, flip over to your next page. 
one thing that I suggest that you create is maybe a training value dashboard. And I've just mocked this one up. This is not mirrored after any client that I've worked with. This has nothing to do with any organization I've ever worked for. I just brainstormed what could we do if we were to mock this up in a room. Again, I would do this in a, a shared workspace if we had a, dis, um, a, a geographically dispersed team. I would do it in a conference room and we'd do it on a whiteboard with sticky notes or something similar if we were in person. But we would say, what does our organization really value? And the colored circles around the, the, the center circle are perhaps what an organization might value. Well, we've, we've, we value um, user satisfaction of our training. We value that they're actually completing the training. Um, we value that they're learning something. We might value that they're um, that they've changed some behavior and they change the results. And then so what we identify is what are the values that we're going to try to speak to as we talk about this training and how successful it was or wasn't, hopefully it's successful, uh, to our organizational leaders. Then each one of those, we would break down and say, okay, well, how would we measure that? Or what would we look as, at as indicators for satisfaction? Uh, would we evaluate the trainer or evaluate the content satisfaction or how they delivered it? Uh, would we look at completion rates by frequency or by um, job or our operational group in the organization? Um, but then you can look at some of the other ways. How would we track and measure behavior? Well, we might have managers review their employees. We might send a team out to observe uh, the employees working and see if they're working. Um, we might have them self-report in six months. Tell us about how you use this training on the job. Uh, or we might prescribe a rubric that says we need to check for this data um, and see how much productivity on the manufacturing floor has gone up after this training um, and maybe have a, several different indicators to see that the behavior is being transposed, not just from the training, but actually onto the manufacturing floor in that case. So there's lots of ways. These are just ideas. Um, again, nothing, not any one organization that I've worked with um, in particular, but you could think about this as you brainstorm with your team. What does my organization value? And then how can I speak to the value? Um, a lot of organizations speak in results. I'll just tell you that. And I've already told you that results is the hardest one to get to. So you might want to look at number of critical incidents, money saved, errors reduced, whatever your team's um, you know, keywords are, that can help as well. So I wanted to pause here because I find this very interesting. When I when I ask groups, what did you, what does your organization value? And if you had to test something or measure something or prove something happened because of your training or your documentation product, what would you hone in on? What would be your values? What would be your core values? And then my, how might you track it as you um, as you launch and report back to your leadership? Hopefully this is just like a very pensive pause. <laughs> I have something. Um, we're in the process of um, selecting a new content management system and trying to establish the metrics that we're going to use for um, establishing its value over time. And um, so we've got a list of metrics that we're working with a consultant to compile. Right now, all of the things we want to capture before we get into the system. And it includes things like team morale, because um, you know, you know, the the headspace people are in with our current system, which is, you know, end of life and it's full of problems. We're troubleshooting all the time and things take longer than they're supposed to, and people are concerned they're not going to meet their deadlines, all of that stuff. So we want to measure that and we're going to use surveys and that kind of thing to try to capture um, the, the frustration that people are feeling in the current system. But then with the new system, um, our anticipation is that that's all going to largely go away and, you know, we'll substitute the frustration of learning a new tool um, for the, the, the kind of acute frustration that we're experiencing now in our system, but it will 
resolve over time. So part of it is, you know, trying to understand what we need to capture now um, as a baseline for all of these things. But morale is really important in addition to, you know, the efficiencies and all of that stuff. But um, we need that in order to, to make a case down the road. And we're thinking, okay, we wanna be able to keep this system. You know, if, if the business wants to suggest or push us to go to another system, um, we wanna establish the success of this system and all of that means, um, it, you know, we were just acquired. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on that makes this even more important. So, you know, the, the focus on metrics of various kinds and what you need at the beginning and the end to make the cases is, is what we're, we're exploring right now. That's a great example. Um, any kind of change, whether it's a knowledge change, a learning change, a software change, it, it takes a lot of discussion, but having those early metrics to compare to your after metrics for results and behavior and oftentimes learning, uh, that's huge. And I love that you threw in the nature of um, employee satisfaction and morale, some of those things that are somewhat intangible, but yet make the world of difference. Um, if everybody hates it and morale is horrible, it doesn't matter how productive it can be, um, you can still tank a project on poor morale. So um, that was a great call out, Bobby. Thank you for sharing. Well, I'm going to scoot on to the next slide because, um, like I said, that's just an example of a of a process map that you can use. I, and I would hope that you would customize it for what works in your organization. Um, but think about if you're if you've never done one of these exercises with your team before, think about what value language your organization speaks and um, maybe what kind of KPIs or key performance indicators that you hear in management meetings. Oh, we've, um, our stock value has gone up or uh, we've reduced errors or we're having fewer calls at the help desk. You know, what is the language of key performance indicators that seem to bubble up a lot in messaging in meetings and with leadership? Uh, and then what you wanna do is then say, okay, if these are the KPIs that matter, if these are the values that matter, and these are the things that matter on our team to make this work, how can we track our value? How can we turn our training program to speak towards these? Because it probably lends itself to one or more of those key KPIs in some way, form, or fashion. We just have to be intentional about how we tie it back to those. Um, and you might have surveys, you might have to do some new surveys, you might have to do some new observations, but don't forget about all the systems that are already monitoring and already at work in your organization. So if you have an LMS, it might be already be tracking completion rates. It may already be tracking time to complete via SCORM or SCORM reports or, um, or the percentage correct on each exam uh, or assessment at the end of the lesson. So Think about how you can use what's already systematically operating before you go reinvent the wheel because those take time. They take uh, developmental hours, resources to not only build, but then to implement. Um, but try to tie and be strategic between those as you try to wrap that value up and, and share it with others. And then think about how to communicate. How are we gonna get the word out about what we've done here and the value it lends? And so we want to make sure that, that that value, once we know it, I mean, we know it's valuable. It's important work. We know the value, but it's about telling others and helping them to see it. So me messaging, packaging that message to others so that they can um, share it and get to the right channels and make sure that your work is recognized for the brilliance that it is. Okay, so again, this whole work, when we come here, is all about bringing us back into the circle. So we use that data. Um, not only to feed and tell what we our story about what we've accomplished, but then to feed back in to analyze. So I put this slide back in here one more time so that you could remember that we take that knowledge and we put it back into the analysis so that we can turn around and redesign. There are next steps. We don't stop. We never stop. It's who we are, right? Um, we integrate the course into some sort of professional development planning. So maybe you have a track for each employee type 
and make sure that this goes on the curriculum map for that employee type. Um, maybe there are different curricula within different subject matters and make sure it gets filed in and uh, indexed like we were talking about earlier with the right curricula. Uh, we wanna make sure that there's a training dashboard or reporting system somewhere, some way that we can review periodically, monitor, and then uh, share with others as necessary. We wanna monitor those feedback forums anytime somebody um, says, I'm, I'm stuck here, I can't get it to complete, I, I don't understand this, or I'm having trouble here, that somebody is reaching out and addressing those as they are escalated. We wanna make sure that we're, we've are we got a revision and relaunch plan, that it's not just, okay, that, that was good, we'll launch again next year. Um, turns out learners can see right through that and they say, I just took this last year, why do I have to take it again? So sometimes we have to reimagine the same content if it's mandated so that it looks a little bit differently and it lands a little differently. Um, and that's how we can have three training programs about the same topic, but it's like, well, yeah, but it's not the same course. We wanna, we wanna make sure that we are speaking to people in the time that we're speaking to them in, in, in the same way so that we can kind of keep it fresh and keep them engaged each year. And then again, making sure that we're using those communication channels wisely to report outcomes. Okay, well, this is kind of the end of our three series, and uh, I've loved our discussion today. Um, so I'm going to open it up for a few more questions and discussion. I'll stick around as long as you want to chat. But what's still unclear? Maybe you want to talk about what do you still need more support or tooling about? What have we not covered in the series or in today's discussion that you wish we could have covered? Um, maybe talk about how Addie's helped you or your team structure your work. Maybe you have some insight about how you share value in your learning in your organization. And maybe there's just some best practices that you wanna share. We would open the floor to any of that right now and appreciate you chiming in. Well, I'll be first. Um, so I, I think what I'm walking away with is really a good discussion about how do I, me, see my own value? How, what kinds of concrete things can I be keeping an eye on, you know, in the evaluation, self-evaluation, right? And then how do I pass those on to my teammates? This, these concepts are new I think for my organization and I have the opportunity to uh, make a presentation next week on personas and so I want to sort of uh, sell it I, I it's going to be a selling it's going to be a selling presentation as well as an informative one um, because we're not used to thinking that way where I am and so if I emphasize the value and our own value, the value of my organization, how we can actually see that, then I think I'm going to have a much easier time when I present because I'll have uh, packaged it in uh, what's in it for you. You know, this is a new thing. It might be a little weird and awkward in the beginning, but we're going to be able to show the whole organization that we're, uh, you know, we're at really adding value. We're, I think, uh, sometimes in technical writing, we're seen as copy pasters, you know, but we, we, we bring so much more than that. And we'll be able to sort of communicate that to ourselves, see ourselves as valuable, and then communicate that to our stakeholders and our subject matter experts. I love that. And Vicki, that, that sounds like a very exciting presentation coming up on Personas. And if, if it fits your audience, one of the, the exercises I like to do when we are trying to rally folks around a particular value set is to try to use the language like, we're the kind of organization who, or our organization values blank, and fill that in and speak like that. You know, we're the kind of organization who values our customers, or our organization sees the, the value of an independent, um, self-reliant customer who knows how to get things done. And so the more we know about them and can kind of see deeper into who they are, 
the better that we're going to do in designing for them. And so if you can echo back the values of the organization using that kind of, those kind of prompts, that can be a rallying um, and, and kind of a bring everybody together statement before you kind of push forward on your persona work. Got it. Focus on what we bring mm -hmm. and that we can all agree on. That's right. Other thoughts? Well, you guys are delightful. Um, I have loved being with you these past few months. And so if you still want to learn more because we're learners at our core, we want to know more and keep developing. You can always read, observe, and create ID work, connect with IDs in your organization or your network, join the IDL SIG because it's a great group Yay. of people. <laughs> Attend the SD Summit in Atlanta. I will see you there. And you can just reach out to me. Uh, you can email me directly at jennifer at anipso.com or find me on LinkedIn. I'm on both of those uh, every day. So it's been a, a pleasure. So thank you so much for having me, Vicki and, and team. And uh, thank you so much for this, this great session today. Thank, Thank you, you, Jennifer. And this is the time when we unmute and applaud. Thank and, you. We, and we look forward to, we, we love this. Uh, we love having you in the ID and the IDL umbrella. We just think you're such an asset to, um, to our organization, to STC, you know, society level and to technical communication in general. And we, so much appreciate not just that you're such a smarty pants but that you're a generous smarty pants yeah. and we really appreciate that you're willing to come and visit us and uh help us do better at our jobs so it, the pleasure is all mine you guys are rock stars and i learned so much from you so it's, it's just a pleasure to give back to what you guys have given me so i'm happy happy to share and, and share like that's the spirit of stc and i love it yes it definitely is. Uh, so uh, to wrap it up, uh, if you're watching this on a video, links to everything will be in the show notes and keep an eye on our IDL website and our Eventbrite page for more fun. We have lots of things planned and we want to make sure that you're good at your job and that you have the tools that you need.